in that spirit of worship, I'd invite you to be seated and open up the Word of God. We're just going to continue to worship in Scripture. And this whole year, we're walking through songs from the Bible. Some of them are songs that you're going to go, I know that one. I know that one really well. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, I know that one. But some of them are songs that maybe you haven't heard before. Maybe a song that you've been in the church your whole life and you've never heard anybody preach on this particular song. And the song we're going to talk about today is a song of tears. It's a song that is lifted up through a broken heart and through tears flowing. And, and so I want you to just think for a minute about tears. In your life, the tears you might have shed. Uh, the, I, I see more tears now in our family than I've seen for a long time because our boys kind of grew up and all in their you know, late 20s and their 30s now. But now we have five grandkids under six. So we see some tears. <laughs> Little ones can, can cry. How many of you remember stubbing a toe? Remember when you used to run around without shoes on? Have you ever stubbed your, your toe really good where you, like, you just peel back that skin and you just, and the tears, you don't even want to cry, but it's just like the pain is there. Tears, right? You lost a friendship as a kid, as a teenager, as an adult. Tears can flow. High school breakups, couples in their 60s and 70s with breakups. Tears flow. A lost job, a lost dream, the loss of a loved one. All these things can lead to tears. And, and you might be a singer, and that, that might come out in songs with tears. You might not be a singer. A, a modern American poet wrote these words. This is a poet who writes a lot about tears, a lot about pain, a lot about relational pain. Listen to these words. No words appear before me in the after aftermath. Some of you are going to know these words and are going to follow along. Salt streams out of my eyes and into my ears. When I read that, I pictured like a high school guy or girl in the first breakup laying on the ground and tears just running down and pooling up in their ears. That's the picture that came to my mind. Every single thing I touch becomes sick with sadness because it's all over now, all out to sea. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. You are bigger than the whole sky. You are more than just a short time. And I've got a lot to pine about. I've got a lot to live without. I'm never going to meet what could have been, would have been, what should have been you. The American poet is, anybody know? Oh, come on. Taylor Swift. That's right. That's poetry. That's, that's a broken heart. That's tears that flow. But I have a different kind of question for you tonight. What causes the tears of God to flow? What causes God's heart to break? Because I believe God's heart breaks again and again and again. The scriptures are too clear of the heart of God. When there's a senseless, mindless shooting in Georgia by a 14-year-old kid, like what happened today, and people lie dead, I believe God weeps. I believe it breaks the heart of God. When there's growing hatred and a division in a country where family members won't even talk to each other anymore, I believe it breaks the heart of God. When there's shattered families and shattered relationships, when we weep, I believe that our God weeps with us. But in the, in the song we're going to read tonight from Isaiah chapter 5, there's a specific kind of tears that flow down the face of God Almighty. And they're tears that come when his people run from him and resist him and they see his ways and they hear his call and they turn around and they go the other way. And it breaks the heart of God when we turn from his word and his will and his ways. You say, you mean the God of the universe might have shed tears over me? And I believe the answer is yes. Because he is a good good father, like we just sang. And if you're a good, loving parent, and you watch a child of yours running the wrong way, running to their destruction, running to their peril, and you know that you've done all you can to help, and they won't listen, that breaks the heart of a loving parent. And so, God, this is our prayer. As we dig into Isaiah chapter 5, as we, as we look at this, this song God Almighty, that you lifted up over your people. You use this picture of a beautiful vineyard, your people, the vineyard that you planted. And as we see your broken heart and you coming to the end of the rope of what you can do for your people, God, speak to our hearts. Let us know your love for us and deepen our love for you. Remind us that when we turn and run back to you, your arms are always open. 
But when we turn and run, run, run from you, you don't drag us back. Speak the truth of this song, of your word to our hearts this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, each week, uh, each month that we walk through one of these songs, we always talk about every song has a singer. Every song has a person who's singing. This song, it's not, it's not David. It's not the church. It's God singing the song we're going to read about. Every song has a setting. And the setting of this is God is looking at his people, looking at this nation that he's formed, that he's protected, that he's given birth to. And they're running from him where there should be justice and compassion. There's injustice and heartlessness among his people. Where they should be caring for the broken and the poor, they're ignoring them. And it breaks the heart of God. Where they should be running to him, they're bowing down to idols. And it breaks the heart of God. That's the setting of this song. So look with me at Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And we're just going to walk through this, through this song of the heart of God with just a few reflections. First, our God loves his people. Our God loves his people. Uh, in the context of the ancient world and ancient Israel, God's people, the people of God were often called in the Bible a vineyard. That was a common picture that God used of his people and that was used of the people of God. And so we read these words in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard, a song about his people. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. So you picture this beautiful vineyard. It's not hard to picture in Monterey County. There's different places where you see hills and you see these vines growing. And they're watered and they're lush, right? But then our God provides for his people. Look at verse 2. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. It was God who planted his vineyard. It was God who birthed his people. It was God who loved you before you loved him. It was God who's loved each one of us even when we were not aware of his presence. And so it just gives this picture that God provides. He digs up, he clears it of stones. He planted it with choicest vines. He's gonna make this beautiful vineyard. That's the hand of God. But then our God protects his people. The second half of that second verse of Isaiah 5. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. So a watchtower, why? What's a watchtower there for? Safety, protection. Put a watchman up on the wall, make sure it's protected. God says, I planted you, I birthed you, I planted you, I gave you life, I watered you, I protected you. I put a wine press there because, because God's going, because I'm gonna so love you. You're gonna blossom with fruit and blossom with goodness and blossom with joy. And the streams of goodness are gonna flow out of my people. So it's going to be this wine press because his people are going to be so in love with him. That's God's heart that my people will so love me and so follow me that they just overflow with goodness. A bumper crop of joy and kindness and grace and mercy for the nations and love for God. And our God expects fruitfulness from his people. He put a wine press there in the vineyard because he expected there to be fruitfulness. But we continue on in verse 2. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes but it yielded only bad fruit. Can you feel the disappointment? God comes to his people looking for goodness and mercy and kindness and passion and worship. He comes to the vineyard looking for big, big clusters of wonderful grapes. He says, but there's only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem, you people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. God is saying, what do I do here? Tell, tell me, let me get your perspective. Judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard? God says, what else could I have done for my people? I put them in the promised land. I watched over them. I provided for them. I loved them. I protected them. I nurtured them. What more could I have done for my vineyard what, than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? This is the heart of God. Looking at his people saying, I, I just did all I could and just wanted you to love me and serve me and love each other. And care for the broken and the widowed and the forgotten and the orphaned. Again and again and again, God said, you're my people, so now go with my love to this world and show it. And love each other and love me. And he says, but, but there's, there's no good gra grapes in this vineyard. And then what happens next is hard to understand. There's a reason why not very many pastors preach on this song of the heart of God. And it's the next few verses. But I want you to stay with me. And I want you to hear these words. Now I tell you, what am I going to do to my vineyard? I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds 
not to rain on it. And you may read that and say, wait, if this is a picture of the heart of God and the vineyard is his people, you're saying that God pulls back his hedge of protection? God allows them to live with their consequences? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever walked with somebody who was a drug addict, with somebody who was addicted, with somebody who was destroying their life and you loved them and you cared for them and you provided for them and there came a day where you finally realized nothing I'm doing is helping. The only thing I can do is this. Step back and say, not, not another 20, not another 50, not another 100, not another night under my roof. You gotta go figure it out. As a pastor, I often say, I get the closest, I get to stand closest to the best moments of life with people. And I get to stand closest to the most deep, painful, hard moments of life. And I have been with too many parents who have said, my daughter, my son has gone, done this and gone here and done this. And I just think I'm at a point where everything inside me as a dad or a mom says care for them, but I know I have to step back and I have to let them go. I've never seen a parent do that with any malice or hatred in their heart. I've seen them do it with tears and love because they realize the only way that child's ever coming back is if they can fall far enough to where they look up and see God and come home again. I believe this is the heart of God in this song. I made you. I birthed you. I loved you. I dug out a vineyard. I planted vines. I watered. I put a watchtower to protect you. I put a hedge around you. I did everything I could do for you because you are my children and I love you. And you've run and run and run. And now all I can do is stand back and say when you're ready, come home. That's the heart of God for you and for me. And in just a minute or two, we're going to go to communion. A moment where we can look at our lives and search our hearts and say, oh God, are there ways I'm running? Are there ways I'm fleeing? Are there ways that my heart has grown cold to you? Are there ways I've become bitter towards you? And is it time for me to come home again? Our God mourns over his people. Look at verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 5. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, the people of Judah. If you didn't get it yet, he says, the, he says, the vineyard is my people. They are the vines he delighted in. But when he looked for justice, he saw bloodshed. When he looked for righteousness, he heard only cries of distress. Our God, we come before you today, this night, with this song that begins with a beautiful tune and tone of your love and your provision and your protection for your children. But as we continue through the song, we hear your heart breaking. We see your tears falling. And God, tonight we don't just think of the nation of your people thousands of years ago. We think about your people today. And for every one of us who names the name of Jesus, we think of ourselves. And this is our prayer as we prepare to come to the table. We pray the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any evil, any offensive way in me. And oh God, lead me in your ways everlasting. God, in the quiet of this moment, begin to search our hearts. Spirit of the living God, if we are walking close with you, if, if we are walking in, in, in step with your spirit, let us delight in that and let us celebrate that. If we're running, if we're rebelling, if we're pushing you away. Maybe we're even feeling the weight of your hand of protection being pulled back and letting us sort out the mess on our own. We know you never leave us and your arms are always open. In this time of communion, in this time of worship and song through the rest of this service, meet us where we are, speak to our hearts, and show us any place we need to turn and run back to you, knowing that your arms are open, your heart is open. Your love is welcoming us. Draw us to yourself, Lord Jesus, for your glory and for our good. Yeah. Well, as we prepare to come to the table tonight, I want to invite those who have joined us online. Thank you for joining us tonight. And 
If you haven't already done so, now's a good time to get your communion elements and some juice and some crackers and have that ready. In a moment, we'll invite you to go ahead and partake of the elements. And as we come to the table tonight uh, here on campus, we've got our tables in the back of the worship center here. And so we'll be uh, directing you at what point you can go ahead and move back to the tables. We'll be taking communion, taking the elements at the back of the table, and then taking those back to our seat or someplace else in the worship center and taking the elements um, alone at that time. And as we prepare to come to the table, just a reminder that this is the Lord's table. This is the table of Jesus Christ. And as a follower of Jesus, that each and every person who's placed their faith in Jesus is invited to partake at the table. And so if you've joined us here tonight from maybe a, another local church and you're a visitor, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, welcome to the Lord's table. This is his table. And for those of you who've not yet made that commitment to follow Jesus, that this is a sacred honor and sacred privilege for followers of Jesus is to take communion. And so we would just ask you, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, just to refrain from taking the elements tonight. And so as we come to the table tonight, we prepare our hearts for what the Lord wants to do in this time. Listen to God's word from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For wherever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion's a time for us to remember God's love, for us to remember how much he so desires to be in a relationship with you guys. Communion is also a time where we remember the reality of the, what he did for us on the cross, of how terrible that, that day was, the life that he gave, the blood that he shed for you and I. How crazy is that for the payment for our sins, for our brokenness? And communion is also a time for us to recommit our life, to walk in the power and the presence of Jesus Christ and to bear fruit in his name. And we can only do that in Jesus and through Jesus. And so as we come and we partake tonight of the elements, as you partake of the bread and as you partake of the juice, it is a powerful reminder that we are recommitting our life to follow Jesus closer and to bear fruit in his name. And also, and Pastor Kevin shared, that communion is also a time for us to re-examine our hearts. And that passage from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, says that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And that's a reminder to us that, that we come to the table. We're not perfect, but we recognize that it is also a time for us to invite the Holy Spirit, to invite God himself to search our hearts, to examine our hearts. And we're reminded that it is also as Israel's sin broke God's heart, our sin today still breaks God's heart. And so when we come to the table, it's a reminder that we are called to examine our hearts. And so we want to be humble and we want to be open to the Spirit's leading and the Spirit's convicting and the Spirit's correcting in some cases. So as the Spirit leads, we also have the opportunity in this time of communion to confess to God, to bring that which is not of God, which that is not in alignment with God, we can bring it to our Heavenly Father. We can confess it. Because we're reminded in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's desire is that you would experience cleansing and healing. 
And I believe his desire is for tonight. And so in a few minutes, Aaron's going to lead us in a quiet song of reflection. And during that, ta- during that song, we want to give you time. We want to give you time to get alone with God and to experience the love of Christ and to experience what God wants for you. So we want to give you the time to do that. And we also want to give you space. We want to give you space so that you can draw near to God and that you can hear from him. And so if you're joining us online tonight, we want to encourage you that in this time, during this song of reflection, that you would find a posture where you can focus on God and that you would do your best to to eliminate any distractions. And maybe you, you were folding laundry or you were doing the dishes and you're watching. I want to encourage you. God wants to meet with you. And so I want to encourage you to find that posture, that quiet space where you can get alone with God. And for those of us that are gathered here on campus, here in the worship center or even out in the courtyard, we're going to encourage you to just in the time before you go to the tables to assume a posture, to find a place where you can get alone with God. If you want to bow your head or you want to remain at your seat or even bow in the seating area or even come forward and kneel up front here, we want to allow you to do that tonight, both the time and the space to do that. And then after you have time with God, we want to encourage you, after you've spent that time with God, to move back to the tables and to go ahead and secure the elements. And if you want to take the elements, you take the bread and take the the juice, if you want to take that back at the tables or you want to bring it back to your seat or you want to come back up front or you want to come up front and kneel and take it, we want to give you that freedom as well tonight. A time for you to meet with God and to hear from God. And so as we think about the bread, the bread, it represents the body of Jesus. And so as we partake of the bread, when we partake of the bread and we partake of the bread, wherever we're at, we're reminded of Jesus' body. It was broken for you. And it was broken for me. So that we could be made whole. That in Jesus provided the perfect sacrifice for us to be reconciled to the Father, to be made right. And also tonight, as we partake of the cup, that the cup represents the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who shed his blood for us on the cross. And we know that scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And so we know that Jesus on the cross, his shed blood covered our sin. And so tonight, when you partake of the cup, when we partake of the cup, we're reminded of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood for us. And so as a reminder, we're going to give you the time and the space to connect with God. And when you are ready, go ahead and move to the tables. Or those of you who are gathered online, go ahead and partake of the elements on your own. And we're reminded that the table of the Lord is ready when you are. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your body broken for us. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood shed for us. And tonight, Holy Spirit, we invite you to search our hearts and show us if there's anything in our heart that is not pleasing to you or maybe areas in our life that are not bearing fruit. Or Jesus, maybe it's even areas in our life where we're feeling anxious and worried. And Lord, we're reminded tonight that we have to rely on you. You are 
our refuge. You are our strength. And so Jesus, tonight, we invite you to have your way in our hearts. Do with us as you would desire for us. Meet us in this place, we ask, Jesus, in your name. Amen.